So in supine position, the heart and its adjacent parts likely compress the central and posterior parts of the lungs. But in prone position, the central anterior parts are compressed. And as a result, it increases cardiac output and improves pulmonary respiration and helps the patient recover faster. So as I said before, it's taking about six months to recover respiratory function back to its pre-COVID level. We don't want to tax the respiratory system or the cardiovascular system. So we should work with these clients on breathing recovery about one to three minutes every hour. Um, that's what the research is saying and that's what they found to be the most beneficial. To review, functional breathing focuses on three aspects, biomechanical, biochemical, and frequency. We should be able to silently nasal breathe at all times. Well, just about all times. So is it okay to ever breathe through your mouth at rest? No. But when speech is being produced, yes, it is okay to breathe through your mouth because the key to functional breathing lies in the efficient and effective exhale. And it's also of major importance to us as SLPs because speech is produced on the exhale. So when we are producing speech, we require a quick inhalation. It's about 10%. And then a slow controlled exhalation, which is 90%. Uh, with a larger volume as well than resting breathing. You're taking in a larger quantity of air, which is obviously easier to pass through the mouth than through the nose. According to Diane Barr, conversational speech uses 25% of vital capacity, loud speech uses 40%, and quiet breathing uses 10 to 15%. And when you're breathing, it controls the prosodic features of speech. So it's more important than just producing words. It's going to change our prosody. So this includes intonation, inflection, rate, rhythm, and syllable stress. Harnessing our breath allows us to harness the power of speech. Almost anyone can benefit from breath work as it can help center them and gain better focus throughout the day and especially at the beginning of a session. So it, it can also help relieve anxiety and become more comfortable with their clinician. Harnessing our breath can help set the pace for our sessions. So adequate breathing is slow coordination of different aspects that we treat in speech. So some of those aspects are swallowing, uh, adequate suck, swallow, breathe is very important for infants, but also as adults, you have to coordinate your breathing and your swallowing, and it's crucial for our airway protection. Uh, typically, we use an exhale, swallow, exhale pattern, uh, but diseases such as COPD and Parkinson's can lead to the reverse inhale, swallow, inhale pattern and that increases the risk of aspiration. Our clients who have issues with cognition, the brain has the third highest oxygen demand of any organ in our body. So there's an established association between impaired lung function and cognitive impairment. However, other lung related processes like increased CO2, retention and white matter structural changes caused by lung cancer can also contribute to cognitive decline. Communication. So we've already talked a little bit of speech, but what about when a patient's intubated or ventilator dependent and can't tolerate a speaking valve? We have an important role in providing communication opportunities with these clients using AAC. 
and our voice clients, structural changes from chronic, chronic coughing or lung disease processes like edema or unhealthy mucosa, they can result in acoustic changes or dysphonia. So these are all client groups that can benefit from breath work. Um, and it, again, it does not have to be somebody who has a serious diagnosis. It can be somebody like a pediatric client who comes in and you're noticing that they're a little bit hard to settle down. They've got that motor running all the time. I like to use breath work with them at the beginning of a session just to settle them down and get them focused. Um, so it can have a huge impact on almost any client you see. So what are some barriers to nasal breathing? Unfortunately with nasal breathing, if you don't use it, you lose it. Meaning that the less you nasal breathe, the harder it becomes. Harvold completed experiments in the 1970s on rhesus monkeys. That's what you're seeing in the pictures. Half of the monkeys had their noses stuffed with silicone for six months and were unable to nasally breathe. The other half were able to nasally breathe and didn't have anything done to them. And obviously there are a lot of animal rights issues with this study, um, but it was excellent in the fact that it illustrated what can happen. The plugged up monkeys established downward facial growth narrowing of their dental arches and an open mouth posture because it was obligatory at that point. They couldn't breathe through their nose, so they had to breathe through their mouth. Additionally, mouth breathing causes the soft tissues at the back of the mouth to become increasingly flexible and move inward, creating less space for breathing. So in turn, when that happens, breathing becomes more difficult, leading to more mouth breathing, unfortunately. Uh, the experiment demonstrated significant changes that do occur to facial structure and the body with mouth breathing. And you can see in the pictures how inhumane that experiment ended up actually being. You'll see that the, the one monkey has normal facial structure and the other one has that open mouth posture and that elongated face. So the good news is that after the study was done, they did unplug the monkey's noses and within six months, their facial structure returned to normal. So that bodes well for people who have been mouth breathing and then switch over to nasal breathing. Uh, there's another study that was completed by Dr. Ann Kearney, a speech language pathologist at Stanford University. She evaluated 50 laryngectomies and found within two months to two years every single patient suffered from complete nasal obstruction. And breathing through the stoma helped prove that if you don't use it, you lose it. So they couldn't pass any air through the nose or anything like that. And obviously they weren't trying to just have the patients breathe regularly through their nose. They did it a little bit more scientifically, um, but they were completely obstructed. So barriers to nasal breathing. Those include, unfortunately, the environment that we live in. They can be environmental allergies, they can be diet, they can be anatomical. There's a whole host of reasons that we have trouble nasal breathing. So your first step after you do that initial evaluation, you've got your intake, um, any treatment program should start with identifying your client type and putting them into a client category based on their medical history and their current level of functioning. That's going to guide your whole plan of care.